There are very few um, sermons that can compare to the beauty and depth and insight that we see in the hymns we sing, especially the Christmas carols. One reason we love them so much is because songs and music can capture something that words alone cannot. We sing, and in singing, the words come alive. They take on flesh and live, if only for a moment, in us. Unlike words that we merely hear some preacher preach. Of course, I'd like to think of every sermon of mine as a piece of music, part of God's exquisite symphony of grace, as meaningful and transforming as the songs we have just sung. But that's probably just wishful thinking on my part. In her 1997 preaching lectures at Yale University, Barbara Brown Taylor said that to preach is to toss the fragile net of our words over the bone-melting music of God. In other words, preaching is an attempt to capture in words the very music of God, God's bone-melting music. In today's lessons from Luke, Mary waits and anticipates as only an expected mother is able. She waits as a new life given by God grows within her. She will, in nine months' time, give birth to a new word and a new world. Noted preacher and author Calvin Miller wrote a book once in which he called Jesus the singer, who sings to the world God's new song. Indeed, God's song is growing in Mary. God's song of newness and life rises from the deepest recesses of her heart. Any apprehension of what is happening to her is all but swept away by the jo immense joyful expectancy of what the angel and her cousin Elizabeth have told her. After all, when your heart is about to explode in the bone-melting music of God, how much power will you give to the whispered small-town gossip you might hear? There is something about this season in which we anticipate Emmanuel, God with us, that demands music. There is something in the air at this time of year that causes our souls to burst forth into song. I don't remember the name of the theologian, but one rather famous one was criticized because it was said every time he came to the end of human logic, every time he came face to face with the unfathomable mystery of God, he would sing a song, one of the hymns of faith. The bone-melting music of God is impossible to capture by mere words alone, no matter how gifted a preacher may be in stringing together verbs and adverbs and nouns and adjectives. And so this morning, my purpose is not to turn the Magnificat of Mary into some exercise in dissection where we examine each word and phrase for its deeper meaning. That would take the life right out of it, the beauty of this passage would be obscured by the words I would speak. Rather, I hope that somewhere in the midst of their words, we can sense this bone-melting music of God, a music that invites us to participate, to join in, to raise our voices in hope and expectation. Howard Thurman captured the sense of this when he said, there must be always remaining in every person's life some place for the singing of angels, some place for that which is in itself breathlessly beautiful, something that gathers up in itself all of the freshest of experience from the drab and commonplace areas of living and glows in one bright light of penetrating beauty and meaning and then passes. The commonplace is shot through with new glory. Old burdens become lighter Deep and ancient wounds lose much of their old hurting. A crown is placed over our heads that we, for the rest of our lives, are trying to grow tall enough to wear. Despite all the crassness of life, he says, despite all the hardness of life, despite all the harsh discords of life, life is saved by the singing of angels. Old Elizabeth knew this as did her husband Zachariah. And Mary knew it as well. And of course the angels knew the power of song. My words are inadequate to speak about the new world that is coming in Jesus' birth. The closest we can come to expressing the inexpressible is in poetry and song, the song that Mary sings and the carols that the hymn writers of the past penned and composed. 
and so Mary does sing. And what wondrous music it is. It is a song beyond her training, evoking prophet and poet king. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has joy in God my Savior. And she begins to give voice to a new world yet unknown, but growing within her. Words that she keeps deep in her heart, memorized so well that years later, we suppose that when a young doctor named Luke comes in to investigate what had just happened in those days, she remembers the wonder of those words that came from outside her and from within her, words that she had never let go. And of course, if there's anything we must do during this season, above and beyond all the present buying and feasting and visiting with a few friends and family, it is this, we sing. Even if we sing alone in our homes and cars, even if we sing out of tune, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere that Jesus Christ is born. These are gospel words, good news words, words that wash over us and around us and in us and through us, all telling us that in the midst of the old, something new is happening in our world, and we cannot get away from it. The music will not let us. Mary sees this. She sees a new heaven and new earth of justice and peace, of bringing down the proud and raising the humble. Here is a vision not of some other world somewhere else, but a vision of God's world coming to our world. Here is God's will done on earth as it is in heaven. This is where we're headed, not just to streets of gold and an eternal choir rehearsal, but rather toward that place that time when God's will will be done in the world and a new song will be sung. It makes a great deal of difference when you're struggling through this life, if you know where the story is headed. The present pain is real, but knowing the last verse of the bone-melting music of God prepares us and emboldens us for all that God is preparing to do through us and in us and with us. That is Mary's song, and it is ours. As all of you probably know by now, The Shawshank Redemption is one of my favorite movies. In this film masterpiece, Andy Dufresne is sentenced to two back-to-back -back life terms for crimes he did not commit. The tough world of Shawshank Prison conspires to destroy humanity wherever it can. Andy, however, writes every week to the state legislature requesting books for the prison library. And out of nowhere, nowhere, a huge shipment of used books and records accompanied by a check gets dumped in the warden's office. One day, Andy puts one of the records on the prison record player. Intoxicated by the beauty of an aria, he locks out the warden and plays a portion of Mozart's Marriage of Figaro over the prison loudspeaker. Everyone in Shawshank Prison stands transfixed by the music. It's a moment of sheer beauty in a horrible place. Of course, torture follows when the warden and the guards put Andy into the pit, a dark, dank hole in the ground that all but does other prisoners in. But Andy survives weeks in there. Later, he explains to his inmate friends how he endured. I had Mr. Mozart to keep me company, he said. It is in here and here. That's the beauty of music, he adds. So you don't forget that there are places in the world not made of stone, that there's something inside that they can't get to, that they can't touch. It is yours. That is Mary's song. And she keeps these things in her heart as the constant melody of God's grace and love plays on. And it is our song as well. So we must sing in this season. We sing where words fail us. This time of year is more than about you and me and Jesus. This time of year is God's yes to the world. Advent is God's amen to the way things are and the way things will be, the way things will be when the song is done. In Christ's incarnation, God lays claim to this dirty, dusty backwater planet on the outer edges 
of the Milky Way in love. And as John would later write in his gospel, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now that is a piece of poetry, of music, the music of a new world, the bone melting music of God. A few years ago, Bruce Thielman, who pastored First Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh, spent Christmas Eve in a frightening and unexpected way. He was wheeled into a hospital operating room where surgeons meticulously cut their way into his heart, performing a procedure to save his life. Recovery that evening took a long time. Thielman had been given a great deal of anesthesia. At first he was aware only that he was alive and that he was thinking. And then gradually he began to hear, and what he heard first was a strange beeping, which he ultimately identified as a heart monitor recording the rhythmic contractions of his own heart muscle. That was a wonderful sound to hear. But then he heard the sound of singing. It was a Christmas carol being sung softly and far away. And then the carol came to an end, and those who were singing began that gospel hymn that was written for the movie Lilies of the Field, called Amen. And even though he had a great tube going into his mouth, connected to a machine that was doing his breathing for him, Thielman began trying to form clumsily the words of that song with his lips. Amen. Amen. When he opened his eyes and there above him, he saw what he remembers to be a great smiling face. A nurse who said to him quietly, Love, you're singing with us. And Jesus is born. Amen. She bent down and kissed him. Thielman later wrote, it was one of those moments that touched the very center of me. Something touches the very center of us when we lift our voices, weak and awkward though they may be, in praise of the God who created us. So let the earth hear our voices and let heaven hear the sound of your heart today and in the days to come. Amen.